Welcome to the second part of my presentation on shadow banking and securitized banking. This time, we're going to look at securitized banking mainly by looking at how investment banks operated, especially during the GFC, and how investment banks fitted in the picture discussed earlier in the first video. So before we begin, let's have a recap on uh, repo markets. So the term repo is simply an abbreviation for repurchase agreement. So to illustrate, let's look at this diagram. Here, the investment bank would enter the repo market with a collateral. And the investor, for example, a hedge fund, would buy this collateral and pay the investment bank an amount X dollars. Now, this transaction is very short term. Usually, um, the investment bank would have to pay back the collateral or, or Sorry, buy back the collateral in about 30 days. So the investment bank agrees to buy back the collateral for an amount Y dollars, where intuitively the amount Y would at least be equal to or greater than the amount X. So the, repo, the, the repo rate can be calculated as simply y minus x over x percent. So what we've seen here is called a secured lending system. And as you can see, the type of collateral is very important. So with this in mind, let's see how investment banks operate. Investment banks are not like traditional banks in that they don't hold deposits. They instead raise funding in the repo market, as seen here. So let me, um, let me illustrate this in this diagram here. So first, the investment banks buy loans or mortgages from brokers who in turn buys mortgages or loans from borrowers or holders of mortgages. And the investment bank then uses these mortgages, which I will denote as a capital M, bring it to an SPV or an SPE, securitize it into a CMO or a CDO. And as you have seen in the first video, they would sell it to repo investors sorry, just, um, just investors for notes per, no, no proceeds, which will then be brought back to the investment bank. And at the same time, the investment bank would use these collaterals. So they would bring these collateral, which are basically the CMOs and CDOs, goes into the repo market for short-term funding. So they receive short-term funding. Now, remember that this is a very simplified version of what was uh, or what is going on. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the investors in the repo market are identical to the investors buying the securities over here. So also, I'll keep that in mind that investment banks don't usually profit from, uh, from the spread like traditional banks do, but instead profit from fees from these transactions. So what it will do next then use these profits to buy back the collateral. So I'm gonna use um, another color here. So from all this transaction, the investment banks would make a profit by back the collateral, buy back. And since they have bought back collateral, they have more collateral here, enter into the repo, repo market again, they would now receive even more short-term funding because they have increased their collateral 
And so this cycle repeats again. They would buy more mortgages from brokers, bring more mortgages to securitize, and you see how you see how uh, this cycle would repeat itself. And because investment banks uh, benefit from all these transactions, like each time they go through a cycle, they collect more fees and they become even more profitable. So, investment banks profit from um, all these fees and they make huge profits. And this is exactly what happened pre-GFC. These investment banks and commercial banks were becoming so profitable with this shadow banking and securitized banking system that, that they ran out of mortgages to securitize and started accepting subprime mortgages. So, subprime mortgages. And so, these subprime mortgages were brought into the cycle to securitize and ended up being a huge part or at least a major part of this collateral here which led to the repo market or the short-term interbank market shutting down. So uh, we all know how that story ended, right? Let's return to the very, very first diagram that was shown in my first uh, video, this time with investment banks in the picture. So we have the diagram here, which basically combines shadow banking and securitized banking where securitized banking over here, um, where the, the errors are in blue and securitized banking is over here with, invest, with, with the investment bank operating over here and the errors are in red. So basically one, one of the major problems with this banking system was that it was unregulated. Basically no one knew what was going on until a number of subprime mortgages started defaulting and caused a dramatic domino effect which led to the crisis. And remember, the thing about repo markets or interbank markets is that as, as we've seen, the type of collateral mattered. So once these collaterals were substituted by subprime mortgages and because the subprime mortgages start to default dramatically, no one were, were um, no one, no investors in the interbank market or the repo market were willing to lend money for these collaterals. So the, inter in the interbank market and the repo market froze, which then led to the GFC. Remember this diagram is only a simplified version of what happened. And in truth, these investors consisted of banks from all over the world. So when big banks like Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch went down, the whole world was affected. So this is the end of my presentation on shadow banking and securitized banking. I hoped this helped your understanding on how commercial banks and investment banks operated using these unregulated systems during the GFC. If you have any questions or feedback, please comment or leave comment in the comment section below. Thank you.